Hi folks, Craig Marchand here again with the Service Sales Academy and your virtual instructor-led training program. In this episode, we're going to talk about improving technician productivity. In a previous episode, we talked about measuring technician productivity, but let's talk about making it better now. Production, look, we've made the case for measuring production, right? And, and hopefully we made a good case for it. You know that, that productivity is what makes you money at your shop and hopefully you have targets. If not, go back to the measuring productivity program and figure out your targets and, and start measuring and let's start there. And once you start to measure, then come back to this program and let's talk about how we can improve it. Because now we've actually got to improve it since we've been measuring. All right, so if technicians produce our product for us and the more product they produce, the more we have to sell, the more we have to sell, the more money we make, what gets in the way of production? I think when I when I observe repair shops and try to solve the problem of, of not enough productivity, it comes down to these five these five bullet points to me. Either our productivity is low because there's not enough work, or it's low because technicians are standing around waiting for work. Sometimes it's really bad communication. Well, not even bad, maybe just maybe just poor communication in the shop that slows our productivity. Sometimes it's the definite skill set of the technicians that, that slows it, but other times it's they spend a lot of time messing around with equipment or they don't have the right tool or they have to share tools or share equipment and that slows things down. And still in other shops, it's just a, it's an attitude. It's an attitude of non-production. What I, I I'll, <laughs> I'll give you a secret. When I write this up, stuff up as a consultant, the way I word this is, uh, a culture of workplace employment has developed rather than a culture of productivity. Meaning, hey, we just we go to work to go to work because they pay me every week, so I go to work. And I like fixing stuff, so yeah, I walk around and I fix some stuff during the day. But I don't actually produce. So it could be any one of these five things that might get in the way of, of production. If you want to keep a technician busy, <laughs> oftentimes it's a mind game. Believe it or not, it, it can, it can, it's kind of strange how often this is just a mind game. Applying pressure, what I call creative urgency or creative pressure, is a really good way of creating more productivity. You just want to pressure the system a little bit. Just pressure the system a little bit. You know, we, we use the the opposite of this. I, I recently saw in a in a, uh, in a in a training program I was sitting in on, where and, and you've seen this that, that if you push against somebody, they're going to push back, right? But if you don't push, they don't push back. Well, that's great when we're having a discussion, but it's not so good if we want the system to get better. So we've got to put a little bit of pressure on the system or the system won't move because we want the system to move in this case. So gentle pressure and urgency is good. If there's enough work available, that can really drive productivity because the urgency is there. We've got work, we've got to get some stuff done. So, so there's more urgency and there's, there's automatically more pressure in that system. Sometimes you can apply that pressure and urgency or create urgency with a structured pay plan. Because if you build in a production incentive with a pay plan, then all of a sudden, hey, I can make more money if I do a little bit more. And so the system is pressured. Sometimes, as I made the case for in the, in the measuring productivity program, just focusing technicians on producing billable hours is enough. Just measuring and putting a board up on the wall is enough. Any one of these things is part of the mind game that you can play to stress the system just enough to move it forward. You've got to schedule to productivity. You have to schedule the productivity. This is going to make sure that there's enough work. And that was the, that was the first thing that gets in the way. We don't have enough work, <laughs> then productivity doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter how, how fast I get that job done. I'm only going to get three hours today. We just haven't got cars come in. So we have to, we have to drive car count for one. All right, if, if that's our problem, and we just don't have enough to work on, then we can't even talk about production yet. We could talk about maybe gaining some work through courtesy inspections, but we probably ought to talk about growing car count, increasing marketing, et cetera, et cetera. If you schedule the productivity, assuming you have enough work coming at you, you can create a really productive environment. 
and more so, you can actually quantify how much can be done. We talked about that in the other program too. What is your target number of hours every week? Number of bay, number of technicians times eight hours times number of days you're open will give you a target number of hours. And, and that's how many hours you can get done. That's what I call your time bucket, right? Those weekly targets. I didn't use time bucket in the last program, but, but I've used it in previous programs. Your time bucket is the average number of hours you produce every day. All right. Maybe it's, maybe it's not, maybe the reality is not that it is technicians times eight times days you're open. Maybe the reality is you are over a hundred percent productive. You've got a stable full of just high power racehorses. And instead of producing you 160 hours a week, they can produce those four technicians can give you 200 hours a week. Awesome. That's your time bucket. You've got 200 hours that you can produce on average for the week. Maybe you got this number from looking at last year's 52 week average. The number of hours we produce per, per week or per day over the last 52 weeks was X. Great. I'm going to bump it by 5%, 10%, 20%, whatever I want to grow by. And then I'm going to take that number and I'm going to subtract whatever I feel like our average number of upsells is in, in hours. I'm going to subtract a fudge factor for carryovers, fudge factor for rusty bolts, wrong parts, or whatever it might be. And I'm going to arrive at a number that says, here's how many hours I can schedule. Whatever I have left is what I have available to schedule. That's my time bucket. And what that's going to do is ensure that we have enough work every single day and every single week and every single month that I can push productivity with my technicians because they get in the habit of being busy. Once you have that work scheduled to drive this production, so we've got the work coming in, we know how many hours we have to schedule and we scheduled it. Now I got to get them out of their own way. Now I got to get my production employees out of their own way. Here's a trick that I've used in the past. I require their baby empty when they go home for the night. This does two things. I observed a shop one day that did a fair amount of fleet work and because the fleet work didn't have the same urgency that regular customer pay work did, they would finish a vehicle and they leave it sitting in their bay because their pay plan paid them hourly and if there was a vehicle in their bay, it looked like they were busy and they could kind of slack off the last hour, hour and a half, two hours of the day. And we caught this by watching them first thing in the morning. They would come in right on time at 8 o'clock and they would spend the first hour of the day slacking off again because their bay was full. I lifted that veil by saying, you go home at night, there's only two things that can be in your bay. Either a carryover job from today or the first vehicle you're going to work on tomorrow morning. Otherwise, your bay's got to be empty. That's it. Now that did a couple of things, which I found really interesting. It was a sense of closure for a lot of technicians. And it avoided the busy work the next morning. It just, it created more of an urgency. They couldn't hide behind that car or truck sitting in their bay. Because that, that physical barrier between them and the write-up counter let them hide. By getting it out of there, all of a sudden they were wide open. I could look in the shop and I could see who was available to do a job. So the dispatch process began to dispatch more work to the shop. Today, today, we had our O's, we had work to be done. Because remember, they were doing a bunch of fleet work. Well, when you're done, that job goes out. Therefore, I'm going to hand you another job. Even if it carries over to tomorrow, I'm going to hand you another job. It increased productivity just because it got the physical barrier out of the way and now I could, I could communicate with my eyes. It also, this was the really interesting thing to me, it also allowed them to wake up the next day, think, you know what, I already have work that needs to be done in my bay. I'm going to go to work. And they started showing up at 6.30, 7, 7.30 in the morning instead of right on time at 8 o'clock. They started showing up early and some started staying late to get it done. So that urgency and that pressure on the system all of a sudden grew just because we made one little rule. Your bay's empty when you go home. If it's not empty, it's a carryover where it's the first thing you're working on tomorrow morning, you want the snow to melt on it. <laughs> Whatever it might be. 
it lets them get busy with real work and it sets a tone because now all of a sudden the shop was busy. At the same time though, we had to ask the service advisors to start staging work, right? So, so it, took, it took that rule, plus it took service advisors saying, look, here's your work for tomorrow, here's your work for later, here's your next job before you've done this job. Because it was mental preparation. And what it did for the service advisors too, was that before they went home, because those technician bins had to be full, the work had to be dispatched, the work we had that day had to be dispatched before the service advisor went home, and the bay had to be empty for the technician before he or she went home. What that did was allow the service advisor to organize for the next day. So the next morning when they came in, they were focused on that day. Not, not yesterday, because we already took care of that before we went home. That work was already dispatched. Do I have to modify it a little bit? Yeah, maybe I do. But it created their urgency. And it allowed, it, it freed us up for preparation for the next day. But it set the tone of we're busy. We're busy. Even if we weren't busy, even the schedule was light the next day, by dispatching work the night before, the technicians had the perception that we were busy. And that alone drove productivity. If you dispatch work, if, if that's your job, and for many of you it is, you've got to get into their bins. You've got to, you've got to, to get it into their bins, right job, right technician. So I tell you, go see the video on dispatching repair orders to check out the best ways of dispatching. All right, but we need to get the work dispatched ahead of time to keep productivity rolling so the technicians aren't waiting for work. We got the work in, we knew how much we scheduled for, so we had enough work, we scheduled to it. Now we got to keep them from waiting for it, so we do that through dispatching and through the sense of urgency that we create, right? And you can even do that on a, on a microcosm level. You, you can do that on a, on a job by job level too. So give me my next job when I finish the first one or before I finished it. Or maybe even give me two repair orders. If, you, if you're still handing out paper repair orders, and many of you are, I know, it's okay. Then give them two. Here, I need this one done first, and then here's your next one. You know what that does? And, and you do this electronically, and, and that's one of the, the built-in awesome things about electronic dispatch is that they, they get to see all the work. They, they get to, I get to see every job that's been assigned to me so far. So when I finish the oil change and I finish the courtesy inspection and I send the courtesy inspection back to you or I hand it back to you, before you get back to me, instead of standing around waiting, going to have another cigarette, another cup of coffee, whatever it might be, go visiting with, with you know Bobby Joe there, I'm going to go, I already know my next job, I'm going to go check it out. Most technicians like to be busy. I'd say 90% of technicians really like to be busy. They really, really do. They like what they do and, and they just they, they have a sense of accomplishment. So if you give them more than one job at a time, it's going to increase their productivity. And then there's communication, right? Now this relates to dispatch as well because every job that gets dispatched has a level of communication that comes along with it. I really like team systems. Even in small shops, I, I've got four bay clients that I set up teams. Each service advisor has, has two technicians. Well, if you've got one service advisor, I already have a team, right? All right, that's easy. But it streamlines communication. I don't have to know what you're doing. You don't have to know what I'm doing. I don't have to know what your technicians are doing. Your technicians don't have to know what I'm doing. I know my two guys or my two girls or my guy and my girl. I know my team. And so there's less for me to manage as a service advisor. You cannot have more than four techs per advisor, though, and sometimes four is too many, especially in an independent repair shop. Because look, this really boils down to how many repair orders a day is each advisor handling. In my opinion, and what I advise my clients, is in an independent repair shop, each advisor should be handling 10 to 12 repair orders. In the dealership world, the, the, the norm is like 18 to 22. That's, that's what, what their goal is, 18 to 22. In our world, 10 to 12. 10 to 12. But if I have four techs on my team and they're each doing five cars a day, whoa, I'm at 20 repairers. Ouch. Okay, so the reality is, is in the independent world, two, two highly productive technicians, maybe three, if they're highly productive. Because, I mean, that could be 15 repairers a day. Now you're maxed out. So keep teams small. 
But I like teams for the sake of communication. Because with that direct communication between me, me and the technician, there's not a lot of waste of time. And no waste of time means higher productivity. Some shops really like central dispatch. I'm not a big fan. I've let some do it just because I didn't want to argue. But they want to give all the repair orders to an individual to dispatch. Usually that's an ego thing, in my opinion. Because this creates a bottleneck. Why do I need to do it? If I've, got, if I've got one service advisor and three technicians, I don't need a shop foreman to dispatch for me. I don't need central dispatch. I can dispatch, and it might even be faster. Central dispatch sometimes creates longer wait times. I don't like it. Some, dis some central dispatchers can handle it. They can do it. They're proactive. They get ahead of the curve, and, and they, you know, they'll give every guy two or three ROs. But at some point, somebody's waiting for work, and I don't like that. And then there can be a longer line of communication, because sometimes the communication goes from the tech to the dispatcher, shop foreman, to the, the service advisor, to the service counter. I don't like that. So I'm not a big fan of central dispatch, but it can work. I like electronic dispatch. There's a wicked learning curve to it, though. Yes, I live north of the wicked line. There is a brutal learning curve sometimes, but I think it's worth it because dispatch is instant. I can see all the jobs that have been assigned to me. I can see what order I need to get them done in. If I like to text, if I'm, if I'm decent with a tablet or, or a cell phone, the communication can actually increase, you know, because you're communicating via text, essentially. And, and some aren't, aren't using the actual dispatch system to do that or the, the courtesy inspection system to do that. They're using something like Slack to do that, but it can get faster. It does require a different way of thinking, but most shops can adapt to that. For most shops, it can work really, really well and it smooths communication and it, it increases productivity during the day. It, it's, a, it's a great solution that's relatively easy once you get through that learning curve. No matter what dispatch system you use to improve communication, you've got to have morning meetings. I, I, I'm, just, I'm such a fan of these because it's a communication tool and it's a productivity increase tool, not just because of communication. It's because we can focus technicians on their numbers. We can say, here's how many hours we had yesterday, let's try to beat it today. Johnny, you rocked yesterday, you were, 80, you were at you know, 180%. I bet you can't do it again today. You can challenge people. You can also say, look, schedule a little bit light today. Let's really focus hard on courtesy inspections. We're not gonna sell anything we don't need to sell, but let's make sure we're not missing anything. All right, if you've got any ideas for, for work that we can call up and get in here, then come let me know. But let's try to beat yesterday's numbers even with a light schedule today. You know, I like it conducted by service advisors. I mean, service managers, fine. But what you'll notice over time, if you do this well and consistently and quickly, you know, you gotta keep them short, <laughs> really short. But if you're, if you're short and consistent, you're great. Because you're gonna start seeing the team challenge each other. And they're going to start digging for the work and, 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 and trying to fill the schedule. And, and, and they're going to pull together to make productivity improvements. And it's going to be really cool to see because then you're going to be making more money too. All right? Competition. You know, put the names on the board. Get the whiteboard up on the wall. You know, I did see a shop that used, a, they, they put a, a spare TV, huge TV, out in the shop where they would put this on the, on the television, basically in an Excel spreadsheet, but on a PowerPoint slide, kind of like what we've got going on here. But it was real time and, and people could see it. They could see it. And, you know, it's part of a, a lean management technique. A lot of, a lot of collision repair um, that subscribe to the lean technique are, are using a system like this. Real time numbers, I can see where I'm at. I can see where everybody else is at. It creates that competition. Don't forget to use it. Powerful, powerful tool. If you think you have productivity problems and none of these solutions so far are addressing it, then look at your in-bay efficiency. Do you have the right tools? Do technicians have access to the right tools? If not, why not? Are they, are they in reasonable repair? Bottom bullet point, <laughs> maintenance of equipment. Do you have enough tools? Do they have to share too many? You have one scan tool for eight technicians? Are the, are the scan tools you know, up to date? Is your alignment machine up to date? Is all your equipment and tooling up to date and in good repair? 
That can slow things down. Look, I've done math in previous programs about what 10 minutes a day represents. It's brutal. Or 10 minutes a job represents. That can be an hour a day. I mean, it can be $30,000 a year you lose because of 10 minutes a day. So if you want incremental improvements, figure out how to eliminate that 10 minutes of wasted time a day. How do I, where do I have to go to get my fluids? How do I access those? How far do I have to go? How about parts? Can you get me parts quicker? I mean, look, I know a shop right now that, that one guy, because he works out in a, a bay far away, he's got to drive a golf cart to go get his parts. Seriously, how productive could he possibly be? Not very. It takes him 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes if he visits. Boom, $30,000 a year, gone. We gotta have a better way of doing this. Gotta have a better way of doing this. So examine what makes technicians efficient in their bay. And, and are there gaps there for you? Are there gaps? Can you get somebody to bring parts to the technician? Look, in an eight bay shop, I can justify having a parts guy. Because they improve productivity. Look at these things. Think about these things. Efficiency means productivity. And then there's the attitudes I mentioned. Usually attitudes are created by shop culture. Check out the video uh, on employee recognition. If you want to grow a positive culture, there's a lot of things you can do to grow a positive culture and we don't have time to get into it today, but you can, you can begin to recognize one another to begin to grow a more positive culture. Busy shops generally have a great attitude. They're busy. So take everything in the program to this point, <laughs> everything that, that we've done so far, and implement that. And if, if all of those things you know you've done and you've done well, and you still have bad attitudes, then we'll talk about shop culture. Give me a call, shoot me an email, and we'll fix that. All right, take a look at your pay plans. Are they incentivized? All right, all these things generate attitude, or generate attitude rather. They all relate to attitudes. In summary, technician productivity has so many factors to it. So many. But there are some big chunks that you can pay attention to. One of those is making work available. Because if work's available and you set a tone for production, you're going to grow productivity big time. If you ensure efficient dispatch and good communication, you will grow productivity. Those are the big chunks right there. Making sure work is available, setting a tone, setting that urgency, efficient dispatch, good communication. Those will give you big gains in productivity. And then do techs have what they need? Is what they need readily available? That'll give you incremental gains in productivity. And if you can make it so the technicians only have to produce work and don't do non-productive work, that's another incremental productivity gain that you'll realize. All right? Watch this program two, three times. Implement the practices here. If you have any questions, give me a call, shoot me an email. And until next time, keep up the great work and never stop learning.